Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Washington Times for this special episode of History As It Happens. I'm Martin DeCaro. November 22, 1963 is a very dark day etched in the memories of every American who is old enough to remember it. The day John F. Kennedy was assassinated at the age of 46 by Lee Harvey Oswald. Less well known is what happened on November 2, 1963, just a few weeks beforehand in South Vietnam. The autocratic president of that American ally, No Din Diem, was toppled in a coup d'etat and then murdered by the plotters. And because of the remarkable work of our guest here today, we now have a clearer idea, I would even say an entirely clear idea, of JFK's role in that drama in South Vietnam, in that coup and assassination. Ken Hughes, welcome back. It's great to have you here. Thank you, Martin. Thank you for uh, that, that kind introduction. <laughs> well, now I'm going to pummel you with questions All for right. about an hour. That's fair. Ken Hughes, researcher, historian at the Miller Center, which is a great resource, by the way, at the University of Virginia. You are also the author of a couple of other books dealing with White House presidential tapes. We have Fatal Politics and Chasing Shadows. I almost flubbed the titles there. <laughs> I know I could have said. I do too. Yeah, chasing politics now. <laughs> chasing shadows and fatal politics, which are about the Nixon, the Nixon years. They deal with Watergate and Vietnam. Uh, these are terrific books. Thank you for not writing 1,000-page books. I would not be able to balance them on my uh, on my lap here. But they're not easy books, and I mean that in a good way. They have to be read very carefully because of your work as a researcher. Before we dive into the history here of of Kennedy and Ziem in South Vietnam. I want to just familiarize our, our audience a little bit with the work you do. You've been called the master of the White House tapes. <laughs> what do you do? Um, I, uh, I basically do a job that most people don't want to do. I listen to uh, the White House tapes, uh, started with Richard Nixon's, which were the most voluminous. He recorded 3,700 hours of White House conversations, but also Lyndon Johnson's. Uh, which people are familiar with from C-SPAN, yeah. and, uh, and John F. Kennedy's. Um, he, he was the one who really started uh, taping in depth. We got about, you know, about 250 or 260 hours of the Kennedy administration on tape. Yeah, and, and those are the three presidents who had a recording system, right? Kennedy, yes. Johnson, Nixon. That's pretty much it. They were the ones who recorded the most. A few other presidents recorded a little. We've done some with FDR, who's fascinating. Uh, some with Ronald Reagan, who just recorded a few of his international conversations in the Situation Room or through the Situation Room. So, uh, but th yeah, those are the big three. Kennedy, Johnson, and Nixon. I guess all presidents after Nixon realize it's not such a good idea to have a record of what you're doing back there. <laughs> yes, Nixon ruined it for <laughs> the presidents, uh, the historians of the presidents afterwards because he lost his job because his tapes captured too much history that otherwise would have vanished. Yeah, it's um, it's not a good thing for for society, really, not just historians like yourself. For all of us, we want to have an irrefut irrefutable record of what presidents have decided and have said behind closed doors. It's great, right? It opens a window into what Kennedy was thinking. LBJ, Nixon, we don't, I don't even know what we'll, we'll be dealing with in the future. Emails and text messages, I guess. Yes, I imagine. <laughs> well, we're going to talk about what happened on November 22nd, the assassination of an American president and the Kennedy mystique the darker side of Camelot, but um, we're also going to talk more, really, we're going to start with what happened in South Vietnam in earlier November, really all through that summer of 1963. Um, how did Kennedy set up his taping system? He did it in 62. Uh, he did it for the same reason that other presidents did. He thought he had been misquoted, misrepresented. Um, and so he had a Secret Service technician named Robert Bauck uh, basically bugged the Oval Office in the cabinet room. Uh, he had microphones hidden under the surface of the Resolute desk um, in what looked like a buzzer box on the coffee table in the Oval Office okay. between the two big white uh, sofas <laughs> that uh, he had um, his guests sit in when he sat in his, his rocking chair. And uh, also uh, hidden behind 
the curtains in the cabinet room in, oh, wow. in lamp sconces. So did the people who come in to speak to him, did they know they were being recorded? They had no idea, and he did not tell him. It was a very, very well-guarded secret. He uh, activated the tapes by pushing a button that looked like a buzzer. So they would think he was uh, calling for a secretary or an aide. How about that? But he actually, would actually start a uh, reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder uh, spinning in the basement of the White House. How about that? You know, I learned how to edit audio as a young radio reporter on reel-to-reel. -reel. Me too. And I know. I broke in right before the digital stuff started. Thankfully, it saves a lot of time, although I still work just as much as I used to. Uh, I, I said I was going to get into what happened in 63 in the summer uh, through the fall in Saigon and Washington. But just one other question about the work you do since I asked you about how Kennedy set up the taping system. The audio on these tapes often is not very clear. You spend hours and hours and hours listening to this, transcribing it, trying to make sense of it. It's a difficult task just uh, from a technological point of view. Yeah, and I definitely don't do it alone. We've, uh, we, get, we have at least four scholars go over every tape independently, and all we're doing is looking for one another's mistakes. And that's a, that's a good thing because everybody uh, makes mistakes. We found that like professional transcribers, people like court stenographers, yeah. Uh, who have to give absolutely accurate records, were baffled by uh, the White House tapes, uh, mainly because they didn't know what they were talking about. <laughs> These are all old, obscure political and, right. and strategic issues. I've listened to some of the XCOM tapes. Uh, that's the Cuban Missile Crisis with Kennedy. You know, it's like a speakerphone somewhere or a, a, mi a microphone that's far away from the table. The, uh, the Nixon tapes, for instance, It'll sound like Kissinger is right in front of the microphone and Nixon's far off and you can't always understand what he's saying. It's echoey, they talk over each other, but quite a task, quite a task. So, all right, let's start talking about um, our main focus here. The not so remembered assassination just 20 days before Kennedy himself would be murdered in Dallas. Uh, you've, say, you've said, rather, you've shown definitively what Kennedy's role here was in the coup d'etat of No Din Jim. We'll talk a little bit more about him in a moment. In South Vietnam, based on new evidence, obviously the White House tapes are the new evidence. Anything else that you've come across as a researcher that had been hidden prior to this? Well, the JFK Assassination Records Review Board uh, was a treasure trove of classified information. As you know, Congress set that up because uh, Conspiracy theorists were basically excited by Oliver Stone's movie JFK, and that got enough people interested in getting out every document having anything to do with the Kennedy assassination. So Congress empowered the Citizens Board to do that, but fortunately they took a very broad view of their task and included the political and diplomatic context, as they called it. In other words, what I call the real government conspiracies. Uh, conspiracies involving um, presidents, the CIA, yeah. State Department, Pentagon, um, in trying to overthrow other uh, countries' uh, governments. Church Committee in the mid-70s, of course, got into this. Yes. Yeah, I want to emphasize this point once more for our listeners. The information that you've gathered here is new. Historians are going to be going over your work now to see if they agree or disagree with it or they can add to it. And that's really exciting that 60 years later we're still digging up new, fresh information. As I often say, subject may be old, but the issues are fresh. In this can, uh, case, the information is yeah. also fresh. And I neglected to mention you're actually writing a book now, too, about the Kennedy tapes. Is there a title, working title? Yet? Uh, clandestine Camelot. Clandestine Camelot. It's going to focus on Operation Mongoose and the DM coup, okay. which were Kennedy's two signature covert operations. Yeah. Mongoose was the Cuban government. Yes, yeah, the attempt that failed to overthrow the uh, communist government of Cuba. Okay. And we already talked about uh, Ziem. We're going to get more about more of him in a moment. And I mentioned your other books, Fatal Politics and Chasing Shadows. All right. Now... All right. Who was No Din Ziem? Uh, last name is spelled D-I-E-M. It is pronounced Ziem. Uh, South Vietnam's president. Uh, how did he come into that position and when? Ziem was a, a product of the French colonial system. Vietnam had been a, uh, a, a French colony for many years. Um, and it, it worked with a combination of French colonial administrators 
and Vietnamese who worked with the colonial government. And Ziem, from a young age, trained to be part of the civil service. And as a fairly young man in his 30s, he became ministry of, minister of the interior under the emperor Bao Dai, who was you know, the figurehead emperor. Yes. The French held all the cards and had all the power. And Ziem, once he realized that he was not gonna have much power as a minister, resigned. Um, he's, uh, went to he, America, right? He went to America eventually, but that, that was a while off. Okay. Um, for a while, the, the Japanese controlled Vietnam during okay. World War II. And uh, once they surrendered the communists under Ho Chi Minh, uh, then organized as the Viet Minh, which we later renamed the Viet Cong, uh, took over in 45 and um, took Diem, Diem captive. Uh, but it wasn't to keep him as a prisoner, it was to persuade him to become part of their government. Okay. They wanted uh, uh, a Catholic constituency. And uh, Ziem and his family had a, you know, had a, a fairly uh, a good reputation among the colonial uh, auxiliary, the, the Vietnamese colonial um, yeah. workers. Yeah. Um, but Ziem uh, refused and he got out and he went into self-imposed exile. Uh, so while the Viet Minh were <laughs> struggling with the French uh, to liberate Vietnam, at least from being a colony. Um, Ziem was out of the country in the United States or Japan or France, uh, where he became a, a noted anti-communist. He had a, a Catholic constituency in America, uh, Justice William O. Douglas, uh, Senator Mike Mansfield, and Senator John F. Kennedy all thought, well, this might make, he might make a good anti-communist leader. Um, so eventually the, the French lost their colony in 54. The Battle of Den Bien Phu is the final straw there. Yeah, and... Um, of course, the United States had been backing and bankrolling the French war effort. Yes, that was, that was how we first got involved. And uh, we, were, we were paying for the French effort and for the French colonial government. And that would become a, a key factor in the power that President Eisenhower and President Kennedy had over South Vietnam since the United States paid most of the government's bills. Yeah. Really, this story may start with FDR's death because he opposed colonialism. He did. Harry Truman also did, but not as vehemently as FDR. So after World War II ends, the surrender in August of 1945, you mentioned how Ho Chi Minh and the Viet Minh, they declare independence. Ho Chi Minh even cites Thomas Jefferson's Declaration of Independence does. when he declares independence for Vietnam. But the French want to try to reestablish colonial authority. Mm -hmm. They finally lose that awful war in 1954. So this is during the middle of the Eisenhower administration. Eisenhower just doesn't want to hand, quote unquote, hand Indochina over to the communists. Correct. Indochina is now three countries today, Vietnam, Laos, and Thailand. So he gets behind Ziem. Ziem. Yeah, who was, um, I think, prime minister okay. under Emperor Bao Dai. Yeah. And, and this and is where Vietnam is partitioned. Vietnam is partitioned. Uh, the north is where the communists regroup under Ho Chi Minh. The south is where the French and their, Vietnam, their Vietnamese auxiliaries regroup. And originally there was supposed to be under the Geneva Accords a Vietnam-wide election, but uh, Ziem refused to take part in that. Uh, he said because the communists have not held any you know, free and fair elections, but also he, he knew he would not win. He yeah, had, Ho Chi Minh probably was the most popular, definitely was the most popular individual in Vietnam at that time. He probably would have won the election. Yeah, despite his communism, yes. uh, their, the attitude toward communism in Vietnam was very different from the attitude here in America. So he was also a nationalist as well. He was a nationalist who had definitely fought for his country's independence. and. One of the ironies of Vietnamese history was that South Vietnam owed its independence from France to the communists right. in North Vietnam. Right. So, yeah, so this partition happens at the 17th parallel. These are inventions. There's no such thing as a North Vietnam and South Vietnam until 1954. There are no elections, as we mentioned, because of the fear that the communists would have won. And uh, our man in Saigon was No Din Ziem. He becomes the autocratic leader of South Vietnam and an American ally to prevent it from becoming a communist state. And Ho Chi Minh is in charge in the North. Okay, yeah. so we get to John F. Kennedy, 1961. He inherits this policy on South Vietnam or Vietnam. 
I want to talk about continuities and structures, but one thing that's frustrating, at least from my perspective today, is that Kennedy the candidate had a different or more subtle view of wars of national liberation, national liberation movements post-World War II than, say, Eisenhower. Right? He, he had some respect for people's attempts to establish independence from colonialism. He even was in Vietnam in the 1950s where he kind of concluded, well, this is not a war for us to fight. John F. Kennedy, like other senators and even, you know, members of the Eisenhower administration, realized that colonialism was a losing proposition. All the empires were being broken up in uh, the post-World War II environment. Everybody wanted independence. And uh, we recognized that South Vietnam needed independence in order you know, for the people to rally against the communists. But at the same time, South Vietnam never really had independence because it was utterly dependent on American aid for its survival. We paid for most of their military effort and most of their government budget. And that meant that the, while in name, South Vietnam was a democratic government elected by the people, in reality, it was an authoritarian government, um, and American presidents could choose who ran South Vietnam. Because I, of the aid weapon. Yes. Um, in 1954, the first coup attempt of, against Diem started uh, organizing under the Army Chief of Staff, a General Hinn. And um, he said he could have he overthrown the government easily except the United States told him, if you overthrow ZM, we are gonna withdraw all of our aid. And he said, well, there would be no South Vietnam if they did that. That's right. So Eisenhower was able to thwart a coup just by threatening to, to withdraw American aid. Yeah, I mean, the generals often were not happy with ZM. I say ZM, you say Diem, that's okay. Uh, <laughs> you uh, pronounce it a little bit better. Yeah. Um, because, I mean, the, the whole idea was to um, stop the insurgency that had started to build up in the late 50s and explodes in the early 1960s, which was the Viet Cong by then, calling them the Viet Cong in South Vietnam, because the communists wanted to unify the country under communist rule. And um, Ziem lacked legitimacy in the countryside. He was basically the mayor of Saigon, you might want to call him. Maybe that's an exaggeration. His, his regime lacked um, lacked legitimacy in the countryside of the peasantry, but that doesn't mean the peasantry wanted to live under a Marxist authoritarian state either. Right. Right, so there was that dynamic. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's very true. Um, I think the main strength that the communists had wasn't communism, it was nationalism. It was an agrarian country. Yes. So, you know, and communism is built for industrial yeah. societies, but um, nationalism was very, very strong in these former uh, French colonies, um, because nobody wants to be, the, the first definition of freedom for a lot of countries is freedom from foreign domination. That's right, and the Viet Minh, now the Viet Cong, it spilled their blood fighting the French while Ziem was not in, the country. not in the country at that point. So I said, Kennedy inherits this policy, and I mentioned that as a candidate, he was a pretty keen observer of the international arena, right? We got, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead, no, go ahead. In Kennedy, we've got two things. We've got one, uh, a Cold War skeptic who, who really does sense that uh, we don't have to get involved in a lot of international struggles um, and that it's better, we're better off if we don't. He's, he's very reluctant to intervene in Cuba, but Kennedy, the politician, knows that rattling the saber and taking a very tough Cold War stance makes him more popular. Uh, we were talking about this a little bit before. Yeah, so yeah, the 60 election. Yeah, the 60 election. Um, in, in August of 1960, Kennedy was six points behind Nixon. And uh, he turned to this uh, political consulting firm known as Simulmatics, which claimed to use the computers of the era to, era to do computer simulations of how the voters would react if you try different tactics. And uh, in August, they say to Kennedy, like the, the top three issues are all foreign affairs. It's who can be the strongest in negotiations with Russia, who can make sure that we are scientifically and economically competitive, 
and who is going to make sure that our missiles are strong enough and numerous enough to deter Russia. And they trust Nixon more than you. They trust Eisenhower's vice president more than a senator from Massachusetts. So what they say, what they recommend to him is you have to launch an aggressive partisan attack on the Republican foreign affairs record. Now, in retrospect, we look at the Eisenhower years as a time when America had this uh, un unparalleled power. Uh, the missile gap. Right. right. Yeah, the, the, the Kennedy said there was a missile gap in the Soviets' favor. It was quite the opposite. It was quite the opposite. Yes. We had like a 20 to 1 advantage yes. in, in that. And um, the day after Simul Maddox uh, gives him this report saying you got to do a, an aggressive partisan attack, Kennedy declares Cuba to be an enemy of the United States. Uh, he says they will stop at nothing to bring about our destruction. And the reporters <laughs> were like, are, are you sure you wanted to call him an enemy? And he says, yes, I mean it. And this, is the, this was the, the most, uh, uh, this is the greatest denunciation that any prominent American politician wow. had made of Cuba up to that point. And it starts working. I mean, when we think about the- like Eisenhower's soft on communism, that's something. Yes, yeah. it, but somehow this works. Yeah. When we think about the 60 campaign, we remember three things. We remember the debates, yeah. the religious issue, and uh, the importance of the black vote in the cities. But Cuba, when you look at the debates, Kennedy hijacked the first one, which was supposed to be about domestic policy, and turned it into a partisan aggressive attack on Republican foreign policy. Wow. Uh, when he did his speech on religious freedom before the Houston ministers, he said, you know, I have to talk about this, but we should be talking about the threat of Cuba. And the black vote in the cities made the difference in the end in a very close election, but it wasn't a close election until Kennedy started hammering Nixon and Eisenhower on Cuba. So he comes out of that election knowing that those attacks work knowing that you know if if he can succeed by blaming the republicans for losing cuba in 60. castro then, revolution yeah the castro revolution in 59. Yeah. if he can blame that if he can win an election by pinning that on the republicans then the republicans can win the 64 election yeah. by pinning the loss of vietnam on him that's right and uh of course it was eisenhower who started planning his administration the bay of pigs invasion. So the idea that Eisenhower was somehow losing or going to lose Cuba when he's actually planning an, an illegal invasion, a uh, covert operation that Kennedy, of course, then picks up. Yeah, you know, this idea of, of continuities and structures is important because, as you've just explained, and as I mentioned before, Kennedy did have a different or more subtle approach to what was then called the third world. I guess it's the global south today. But at the same time, he was a cold warrior. He was an anti-communist. He subscribed to domino theories or psychological domino theories. There's a subtle difference between those two things. He also bought into notions of credibility, national credibility, personal credibility. You just mentioned how he was uh, worried about being painted himself as soft on communism or just inexperienced and young and naive. I mean, that was an attack that was made against him. And uh, I guess what I'm thinking about here is what one of my old Ithaca College politics professors used to tell me. Naeem Anaitala is his name, he just retired actually. Uh, he said, this is, um, think of an airplane as the ship of state and the pilot, new pilot gets into the cockpit and he wants to steer the ship of state in the way he thinks it needs to go. And he thinks he's actually in control. Then all these other currents and fortresses start, start buffeting the plane and the plane continues to head in the same direction as his predecessor. And he feels now constrained in his decision making. It's another way of saying that once you're in charge, you're not a candidate anymore, and you sit down with your advisors and they say, well, now that you're president, we've got to let you know that we have all these things happening in this country, we've got all this going on over in this country. Oh, and you're now inheriting three administrations worth of support for South Vietnam, and there's this guy named Ziem. So now, now you own the problem. Yes. Uh, and of course, in addition to all the ideological things I mentioned too about domino theories and anti-communism. And his rhetoric kind of boxed him in, like even though he, he knew that we didn't have to invade Cuba, of that we could, we could coexist with Cuba's communist government. He knew if he just said that, that we accept it, then, yeah. then 64 in Nixon or Barry Goldwater would say, 
the president of the United States said he accepts a communist government 90 miles off our shore. And, you know, that... Republicans did that to Democrats. They did it to as, Truman. As Democrats China. did it to Republicans. Yes, and, and, and vice versa, yeah. Uh, sorry to interject there, but... Um, no, it's true. And, and even when it came to Vietnam, we're going to eventually get to the coup here. Yeah. <laughs> this is how, you know, my meandering interview style by now, uh, Ken Hughes. Setting the foundation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, even there, Kennedy understood that Vietnam was of peripheral national security interest to the United States. It was not a vital one. It was peripheral. That doesn't mean it was of no interest to us or that he was ready to give it up. So he comes to uh, office in January 1961. He gives that soaring inaugural address. I've got to stop waving my papers around here. But uh, uh, I don't know if he had a teleprompter. He probably had his papers in front of him on that freezing cold day in, uh, in January in Washington. But uh, he gives a soaring address in which he again talks about respecting the developing world and we'll be there for you as you throw off the yoke of colonialism. Vietnam was not at the top of his priority list in January of 61, but it eventually does come to his attention. Uh, when did JFK and his closest advisors, McNamara and the others, Maxwell Taylor, start to have serious concerns about ZM, meaning this guy might not be the right man to defeat the communist insurgency. Uh, pretty early on. And you can actually trace those concerns back even to the Eisenhower administration. There were always concerns that ZM couldn't rally the public of uh, South Vietnam to, to fight the communists, that he didn't really have a, a great base of support there, that he was very autocratic, that he wasn't doing the things necessary to broaden the base of support for the government, things like, you know, land reform. Um, yeah. And those are legitimate criticisms. Those, those are legitimate criticisms. But um, the mistake that was being made at the time was they were blame, blaming ZM uh, for a fault that was the entire South Vietnamese government. Once they got rid of ZM, those faults would continue. Of course. Because the government was built on American foreign aid. It's not built on... South Vietnamese support. And Ziem was his own man as well. He obviously knew how dependent he was on American aid and military support. Mm -hmm. There were, by the time of Kennedy's death, 16,000 military advisors in the country. He actually chafed at that. He wanted some of them to leave because the larger the American presence, the less authority it looked like he had. But Ziem was his own man as well. He wasn't just a puppet. He, he was able to assert himself. And that also, I think, probably rankled people in Washington. He had what they call agency. He, he and his family, uh, I think, while they had very little, their, their, their power was constrained by their dependence on American aid yeah. and the constant threat of the communists who, you know, did have enough power to take over the government in the absence of American support. Um, but they did have a great deal of, uh, I think, technical tactical acumen. Yeah. They, they knew what they were doing strategically, and they were able to play... I think American politics fairly well, because whenever you know the U.S. government pressured them to reform or to change their ways, <laughs> they would just argue that the U.S. government was falling for the propaganda of the communists, and um, that they had to they had to take repressive measures in order to fight a, a dastardly enemy. And this this kind of rhetoric did work. They um, well, and well, Zim did some crackdowns on communists. Oh well. yes, yeah. yes. Um, and also crackdowns on non-communists yes. who... We'll get uh, to the Buddhist crisis, yeah. Who criticize his regime. Yeah, to the point about when did the Kennedy people start to have serious concerns about Ziem. You mentioned that they preceded Kennedy's administration. But I'll give you one example here. October of 1961, so Kennedy's in office for just 10 months. Uh, he sends Maxwell Taylor to tour Vietnam. Taylor then recommends a troop deployment to save the situation. Kennedy is opposed to this. Yes. But during this debate, Dean Rusk, who is the Secretary of Defense, if I'm correct, uh, said a deployment would tie Washington's fate to Ziem, who he referred to as a losing horse. Yeah. Quoting Mark Silverstone's book that I actually have over here called The Kennedy Withdrawal. Here, you know Mark Silverstone. He's yes. a colleague of yours, yes. right? Yes, he worked on these... Uh transcripts. We were co-editors. Great. Um, so, yeah. yeah. His book's a terrific book, The Kennedy Withdrawal. So even there, it looks like, you know, ZM's not going to save the day. So why don't we get to 1963 then and, and something called the Buddhist crisis. Uh, ZM had a brother who was the head of his security services or secret police, No Din Nu, and Nu's wife, Madam Nu, 
she was something else. <laughs> she was mocking the Buddhists as they were uh, lighting themselves on fire, self-immolation, to protest the repression of the Xi'an regime. What was going on in the Buddhist crisis of 1963, and how did that influence Kennedy's decision-making? The Buddhist crisis started out as, as a protest of religious discrimination in Hue, the old imperial capital, which was uh, under the thumb of another brother <laughs> of Xi'an, yes. Nodin Khan. Um, and basically, uh, the, the government there allowed Catholics to, uh, to, to wave their flags uh, during their parades, but not Buddhists to do the same. And it, was, uh, it was genuine discrimination. Yeah, and just to know here, Vietnam's overwhelmingly a Buddhist country. Yes. And the autocrat South Vietnam is a Catholic, the, the religion of the colonizer, the French. But go ahead. Yes. Yeah. So um, the Buddhists protest, and uh, one of the protests becomes bloody. The uh, government forces kill some of the protesters. And what starts out as a protest of, against religious discrimination becomes a much broader protest of the entire authoritarian regime. And uh, it, it becomes a, a worldwide scandal partly for the way that uh, Xi'an reacts, which is very autocratically using police state methods and mass arrests. Also uh, for the things that Madame New says, uh, such as you know, if there's another Buddhist barbecue, I will clap my hands. Um, and that was, you know, she was always making these, these politica, politically incendiary uh, comments. Because um, there were some famous photos taken at that time there, this is the era of mass communication. We don't have the internet, but a self-immolating yes. Buddhist monk. Yes. Uh, I think it was an AP photographer, maybe, who caught that famous photo. I mean, that's seen all over the world. Yes, and then Madame New is mocking it as a Buddhist barbecue. Right. Yeah. yeah, and the, the conscience of the world is really shocked. Self-immolation was something the rest of the world had not seen. And even, you know, people, even Robert McNamara said we had to take this seriously, this moral witness against the South Vietnamese government because you know, it, it, it had taken such a, a drastic and, and dramatic step. So you add the Buddhist crisis onto the list of issues that are troubling the Kennedy administration about Xiem. So here's our first real hinge point in the story. Finally, we're getting there. Uh, you know, it's impossible to do this job without a whole bunch of papers. So I'm going through your, the transcripts that you've produced and also a wonderful essay you've written about this whole affair. So you, for people like me, so I don't have to, you know, go back and listen to all the tapes myself. Uh, August 15th, 1963. So we're still a couple, three months away from the actual coup. Uh, Kennedy sits down with Henry Cabot Lodge. Uh, his Republican foe, he actually he beat him in a Senate race a few years before that, eight years before that, ten years before that. Uh, he's about to send Lodge to South Vietnam to be the new U.S. ambassador. And uh, they sit down, like I said, it was August 15th, 1963. What do they talk about? Why is this important? Kennedy chose Henry Cabot Lodge to be his ambassador to South Vietnam for the crisis uh, for a couple of reasons. One, political cover. Lodge was a very prominent Republican, and things were going bad in South Vietnam, and this was one way to uh, make the Republicans own it as much as the Democrats. Um, also, Lodge was, uh, he, Kennedy admired Lodge. As a young man, he thought Lodge was just the kind of senator he wanted to be before he took <laughs> Senator Lodge's job in, in 1952. <laughs> when Lodge uh, spent less time on his own Senate re-election campaign and uh, more time trying to elect Dwight Eisenhower and became a very big part of the Eisenhower administration as UN ambassador. Lodge was uh, a Boston Brahmin, uh, an old style patrician, but um, sincere. He, uh, he quit the Senate to fight in World War II. He didn't have to do that, but he did. Um, and, you know, he's, he has a name that every American school child has to learn because he's named after his grandfather, the first Henry Cabot Lodge, who I think uh, was, a, was the first American Ph.D. in history and also just a, a very notorious imperialist. I mean, we all have to learn that he was the guy who, who killed the League of Nations under uh, right. Woodrow Wilson. Um, 
a family that was a force in politics, no doubt. Yes. Yeah, so this August 15th meeting, 1963, Henry Cabot Lodge Jr., that's mm -hmm. how I should refer to him, uh, is talking to Kennedy before he's about to be sent to South Vietnam. And Lodge had been speaking to Madame New's mother, yes, who expresses before. some real concerns to her about what's going on. Yeah, um, Lodge, ordinarily on presidents, aides are very ginger about raising the subject of assassination. But Lodge gets straight to it. He had met the night before with Madame New's parents. Uh, her dad was the South Vietnamese ambassador to the United States for nine years, for the entire history of the South Vietnamese government, until he resigned in protest during the Buddhist crisis. Uh, he was protesting uh, DM's repressions, even though he was a relative of DM. That's amazing. And uh, his wife was a South Vietnamese representative to the UN and she resigned as well. Uh, they were both highly critical of their daughter, but when they spoke to Lodge, they said, or the mother told him, they're gonna get assassinated. DM knew my daughter. Um, that's going to happen unless you can convince them to mend their ways or get out of get Vietnam. Out of the country. Kennedy is silent. Kennedy on the subject of assassination is at first completely silent. He doesn't say anything about it. And that's important because um, Kennedy has the power to either save ZM and News lives or to leave them to their fate at the hands of the coup plotters. So at first he's silent and Lodge raises the issue a second time. And that's when Kennedy responds with what sounds like a non sequitur to our ears in the yeah, 21st century. He says, is Madame New a lesbian? Yeah, I actually have the transcript here. This is bizarre. It, it does uh, sound and, bizarre to yeah, us. Yeah, Lodge goes, or says, but if they all get assassinated, then you're going to have to, Kennedy, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then you're really going to have to be on top of it all. Meaning, kind of, this is going to be a real bad problem if Zam is shot and killed or whatever, and we're going to own this. And then Kennedy says, well, what about Madame New? Is she a lesbian or what? She seems like an awfully masculine woman. Yes. And uh, the, the Lodge responds, I've got to get my paper straight here. Lodge responds, well, I think she's probably a lesbian. And then Kennedy kind of acknowledges that. Lodge says, I think she was also very promiscuous, sort of a nymphomaniac, too. People loved gossiping about Madame New, but I don't think this was gossip. I, I think... I don't think JFK was changing the subject. If you look at early 1960s pop culture, there's this real strong link between homosexuality and violent death. Um, oh. Yeah, I mean, in, in movies, uh, homosexuality was still a crime at that yeah, point, course, yeah. and crime could not pay, and so in, in movies that featured homosexual characters, they'd either die at somebody else's hands or at their own hands. Um, and that was, uh, I, I think, I don't want to read too much into it. You can't yeah. say that, that Kennedy is giving him a signal that no. it's okay. But we should note that he definitely did not say anything that suggested that Lodge should try to save her life or DMs or news. And that would become, that's the first of what would become a consistent pattern of silence on the subject of assassination, so even when it's raised with them. Yeah, let's, let's pause the narrative here because we're up in mid-August 1963. I mean, as a historian, as a researcher, how do you interpret silence on a subject? Uh, it's difficult. You know, tapes are great. They do offer irrefutable evidence of what people said at that moment, but it's not the entire picture. Right. We have to look at all the instructions that JFK gave Henry Cabot Lodge. And, um, after the meeting. At, at the meeting and yeah, after, okay. every, every, you know, all of them. And there are not at any time any instructions to preserve uh, the lives of DM and New or any member of the No family. To, there's no instruction to make sure that the coup plotters give them safe passage out of the country. And uh, as, as I'm sure you'll, yeah. you'll bring up, there are times when uh, the coup plotters, the main coup plotter, Big Men brought up assassination himself. That's a little bit later. At this yes. early meeting, a coup is kind of a, just an abstract possibility, but yes. not regime change. Right. Um, Kennedy does say he's okay if the circumstances warrant it. He'd be okay with replacing Ziem, not necessarily violently, 
I mean, he had the he had the aid weapon, right? He did have the aid weapon, and he was he was contemplating a coup, but he he said he wanted Juan Lodge to go there and make an assessment before JFK made a decision, but he would change his mind pretty soon. Okay. Well, in that same conversation, I'll try to do a better job of reading these transcripts. You're doing great. Uh, Kennedy says, I don't know whether we'd be better off, meaning without Jim, whether the alternative would be better. Maybe it will be. If so, then we have to move in that direction. But I think I'd like to take a good look at it before I come to that conclusion. So nothing decided here in, in August. Right. But then we get to cable 243. This is a this is a fairly well-known aspect of this drama that you shed some new light on. Uh, Lodge goes to South Vietnam to make a long story a little bit less long. Lodge goes to South Vietnam in August and he sees the situation's a disaster. Uh, he sends a cable to Washington about uh, the fact that there are people in South Vietnam who would be happy to see um, Giem out of the way. Um, here is actually the cable, or this is, this is not cable 243, this is the one that Lodge sends back to Washington from Saigon. A suggestion's been made that the U.S. only has to give the nod or only has to indicate, indicate two generals that would be happy to see Xiem or the news go, and the deed would be done. But Lodge says, don't do this. Action on our part in these circumstances would seem to be a shot in the dark. So Lodge is in South Vietnam. He's made aware that some generals want to get rid of Xiem. He tells Washington, let's not go ahead with this. That cable arrives in Washington, and what happens? Uh, a scene worthy of a conspiracy thriller that I would love to see, uh, you know, turned into a, a movie or a prestige television series. Um, it, it, it's, There's always a chance for that. There's yes. a lot of TV out there. It's, <laughs> it's Saturday, August 24th, 1963. The New Frontiers, Top Guns are out of town. JFK is in Hyannisport. Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara is in the Tetons. Uh, the CIA director, John McCone, is at his estate in San Marino, California. And Dean Rusk, the Secretary of State, is at a Yankees game. And um, at that point, the, uh, the highest ranking U.S. official in the State Department is Under Secretary of State George Ball, and he is getting in a golf game. And uh, he sees two other second level uh, State Department guys, um, Under Secretary of State Averill Harriman and Assistant Secretary of State for Far Eastern Affairs, who's the guy in charge of Vietnam, yeah. uh, Roger Hillsman, show up at the, uh, at the golf course and they want his help in approving a coup d'etat in South Vietnam. And these second and third tier officials, while fairly high up, they're not the deciders on right. this. They're not. They, um, Michael Forrestal, who is the Deputy National Security Advisor, uh, sends a draft cable up to JFK in Hyannisport and says, look, we wanna, we wanna give this uh, okay to a coup. Uh, what we're basically saying is, you know, we will, uh, we, if, you, if, the, if DM doesn't get rid of Madam New and New, if he doesn't get them out of the country, then we can't support him any longer with American aid. And, uh, and why would we want to get rid of his brother and, and his brother's wife? I mean, oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, because they were looked at as sort of the evil geniuses yeah. of, the, uh, of the DM regime. I don't think that's fair. I think what they did was were things that ZM wanted them yeah. to do, and they he, they did them with his approval. But America had been boosting ZM for so many years that it was you know hard to yeah. publicly acknowledge that. So maybe that we get rid of these other him. people. Yeah. He'll, so cable two forty three then with the second and third tier Kennedy administration officials mm -hmm. with JFK. Although they did let him know about this, but he's not in town. He's not in town. Yeah. He doesn't hold any meetings with his yeah. advisors about it. He doesn't talk with any of his top guys. He just says, "Well, if you can get the uh, top civilian available at the Pentagon to clear it, <laughs> then you can go ahead and send it." That's amazing to think that Kennedy was that. What's the word? Um, lackadaisical kind of. No. I think he was, I, 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 it makes sense to me if he thought there has to be a coup to end the Buddhist crisis and put this issue on the back burner for the 1964 election. Yeah. And he would have been better off if it happened while he was out of town and everybody else was out of town <laughs> because it would have yeah. been, it would be extremely controversial politically in America. 
because GM's had a lot of support. And it would have been controversial within his, within his own administration because he was betraying a, a, an ally. Yeah, of course. Yeah, this was an American ally, which is different than some of the previous coups under the Eisenhower administration, where we toppled perceived enemies or people Threats. who just didn't want to uh, go along with the American uh, so-called world order in that early juncture of the Cold War. But not to digress about that yet. So uh, Kennedy kind of greenlights this idea Cable 243 is sent back to Lodge, quietly informing him, I'm actually quoting your work here, quietly informing key South Vietnamese generals that if Ziem fails to resolve the political crisis, release the Buddhist prisoners and remove, as you mentioned, his brother and his sister-in-law from the scene, <laughs> then the U.S. would find it impossible to continue to support Saigon military and economically. In other words, if you want to get rid of him, go right ahead. Yes. You know, you know maybe the general's in the abstract, could have gotten rid of Ziem on their own. But the reality is they always consulted, it seemed, with the United States through all of this. Shortly after this cable is sent, though, Kennedy says, wait a second, we better actually start thinking about this. And here's the second major meeting, August 28th, 1963. Mm -hmm. Kennedy asks about the fate of Ziem and his brother. Why is this meeting, late August 1963, important in this story? What happened was, as soon as the bigwigs got back in town, uh, they were extremely angry, especially the Pentagon. Uh, Secretary of Defense McNamara and JCS Chairman Taylor uh, both were strongly against a coup d'etat. Not that they thought ZM was a great leader, but that they thought there's no replacement on the horizon. There's nobody in the South Vietnamese military who shows any sort of indication of being a better leader. So. Kennedy has to have these kind of tense meetings with his uh, top advisors who are, who are split down the middle. Most of the guys at the top of the Pentagon and the CIA oppose a coup. And, uh, yeah, McNamara was against it. McNamara was against it. John McCone was against it. John McCone was against it. CIA chief. CIA director. Yeah. And uh, most of the top people at the State Department and in the National Security Council especially McGeorge Bundy, the National Security Advisor, who is very influential with, with JFK, very highly respected by JFK. Uh, they were in favor of a coup. And so they spend the week arguing it out. And by Wednesday, uh, that's the first time Kennedy brings up the safety of ZM and New. And he says, I don't know if you want to read it. Let's see. I don't know if I have the exact okay. quote right in front of you, but go ahead. Yeah. He says, um, what's going to happen to them? We, we want them to get out of the country safely if we have any say in it. And so that's the strongest piece of evidence that he wanted them to be safe. But when we look at that in the context of all the cables he was sending to South Vietnam, he never turns that into any instruction to Henry Cabot Lodge or to the CIA in Saigon. And the CIA is conducting all the contacts with That's the right. South Vietnamese generals. On the, yeah, on the day of this meeting or the day after, the CIA approaches a South Vietnamese general. You were about to say something before I get to this next thing. Do you want me to move on to this? I can. Well, just that there yeah. was, there, there's no instruction to tell yeah. the generals, hey, give ZM and New safe passage out of the country. They have served America, maybe not well, but yeah. loyally. And, you know, we, we owe them at least their physical safety. Yeah. Could have been done at any point during this story. Right. Any, all this month-long deliberating over what to do about South Vietnam. Kennedy could have said, whatever happens, don't touch a hair on his head. So the CIA approaches General Duong Van Minh, who is yeah. known as Big Men. Big Men. Because he's, uh, he's six feet tall and he's just under 200 pounds, I think. Um, and most people in, in Vietnam are, are not that big. His other major physical characteristic is he has only one tooth because the Japanese tortured him by prying out his teeth during World War II. Um, he, he's the general with the best, the, the biggest stature, in, uh, metaphorically as well as physically, um, in yeah, Vietnam. described as, a, as close to an authentic hero as South Vietnam has right now, according to the New York Times. According to the New York Times. They, they were aware. So, yeah, so the CIA approaches men to say, okay, if you want to get rid of ZM, so they, they, they ask him if he's interested in overthrowing the government. Now, Big Men doesn't know whether the CIA is serious or whether they're working for New, because the CIA is very tight with New as, uh, since he was the regime's... So they could be entrapping him. Yeah, right? they could be entrapping him. You know, they could just be identifying generals for, 
for New to put in prison. And so the CIA has actually asked him, how can we prove we're serious? How can the US government prove to you that's serious? And he says, oh, that's easy. Just cut off aid to the ZM regime. That will, that will prove that the United States wants the, the government replaced. Okay. So here we are in late August. Kennedy's position is, yes, on a coup if, if circumstances require it. On assassination, He's, I mean, he's not for it, but he's not necessarily saying don't do it. Right. Which he, is, he's, he's wavering. He's, he's wavering. put himself on the classified record as against it, uh -huh. but he has not followed through. Okay. He's still, with, with, with regard to all the key people in Saigon, Henry Cabot Lodge, the ambassador, the CIA folks there, and especially the generals, they are not getting any indication that assassination is forbidden, okay. that it's not allowed. Kennedy does suspend aid to the Ziem regime in early October 1963. Uh, we mentioned how the CIA approaches big Min at the end of August. In early October, Min comes back to the CIA and says, okay, now it's time to get rid of Ziem. We have this, uh, we have three options <laughs> available. Which one do you prefer? So you want to talk a little bit about what those options were and how the Kennedy administration uh, responded to those. Okay, Big Men uh, meets secretly with a CIA agent named, named Lucien Conin. Uh, and he says, I, I now represent a cabal, a, a coalition of, of South Vietnamese generals. We're willing to overthrow the government, but we absolutely have to know what the U.S. position is on that. Yeah, we, we stick need, our neck out. We need to know if you're behind us. Right. We need to know that you won't thwart us the way they thwarted the coup plot against ZM in 1954. Under Eisenhower. Under Eisenhower. And we need to know that our regime will get American aid, the same as ZM. Now these are, you know, these are essential requirements for any South Vietnamese government because the South Vietnamese government is completely dependent on American aid. He mentions a dollar figure, $1.5 million a day in American aid. That's what keeps South Vietnam afloat. That's amazing. And he says, you know, we've got three alternative plans to overthrow the government. Uh, one of them is to assassinate Nu and another brother, Khan, who's like the warlord in Hue, central uh, Vietnam, but keep Ziem around. Um, and, and he says that's the easiest coup plot to uh, accomplish. Doesn't really say how ZM will react yes, to losing in, his brothers. After, family, after right? you know how he'll treat the people who murdered his brothers, yeah. but um, Coney apparently didn't ask him about that. The other two plot, the other two plans were to encircle Saigon militarily with rebel forces, or to have street by street block fighting between the rebel forces and the loyalist forces in Saigon. The assassination plot is kind of the easiest of all those three. It's the easiest, and when um, Conin gets back to Saigon Station, the acting chief of station, Dave Smith, it happens to be his first day as acting chief of station, sends um, CIA headquarters a, a summary of Big Men's coup plot which immediately goes to the State Department, the Pentagon, and the White House. So Kennedy has a copy of it as well, um, laying out the three alternatives. And uh, Dave Smith says, I recommend we do not set ourselves irrevocably against assassination because the other alternatives would lead to a bloodbath. Yeah, yeah, he had a problem with the, some of the details of Big Min's plan, yes. but at the same time, he said these other ones aren't very, you know, these alternatives aren't. He, he said it wasn't realistic yeah. to kill two of Diem's brothers and keep Diem around. <laughs> yes. Ho Chi Minh had killed one of Diem's brothers and That's had right. made him into an enemy for life. Yes. So another key piece of context here in October of 1963, the war is going badly from the Americans' perspective. It's, right. it's, it's not clear yet to the Pentagon that the war is going badly, and it won't become clear until after the coup. Interesting. The, the, the Pentagon still thinks that the war is going fairly well. It can be salvaged at the, the very least. Yeah, but Kennedy thinks that there's no way that the political crisis can remain contained in the cities. He thinks it's going to spill off, and uh, he's worried that it'll get much, much worse in 64. An and election year. The election year. And then he'll have like a, a, a big problem. I mean, his, his two big fears 
were that one, he'd have to send in American troops to save it, and that, that did not happen until 65, or completely withdraw, and then the problem would be that the communists would take over. And that would be a problem for America's credibility in the world, That's and right. particularly for his credibility in America as an anti-communist. Again, you know, if, if he can win the 60 election by hammering Eisenhower and Nixon for losing Cuba, where Americans weren't even fighting, then the Republicans could hammer him in 64 for losing Vietnam. Yeah, as historian Frederick Logoval has argued, I think convincingly, credibility was higher up on the causal hierarchy, if you don't mind me using that term, than domino theories. I mean, Kennedy never totally divorced himself of domino thinking, but the idea of credibility, especially for Johnson, Lyndon Johnson, personal credibility, was higher up on the list here as far as uh, driving the American commitment to Vietnam. What would our allies think? if we give up on one of our allies, uh, or, or give up on Saigon, is what I'm trying to say. So um, we're talking, oh, and also I wanted to mention about uh, what, how the war was going, the issue of whether the war is going well or poorly. Mark Silverstone in his book, The Kennedy Withdrawal, talks about all the different reports that are hitting Kennedy's desk at this time. Uh, most of which say, we need to salvage this, or we can salvage this, as bad as the situation is. Very few, if any, at this point are telling the president, we need to get out of there entirely. Right. Very t So, you know, he doesn't want to give up on Saigon. He's hearing that from some people in the Senate, but it's nowhere near majority yeah. yet. Yeah, um, we also have to remember that most Americans didn't want the U.S. to cut and run from mm -hmm. Vietnam, even though they don't understand the, the war, it's not something that we do. They were being told that uh, it was going okay. Yeah, that's right. That, that's another important point. They weren't yeah. getting always very accurate information from what were called official sources and they were, in those they days. they were being told that ZM was an overwhelmingly popular leader. Um, up that? until, it, you know, the evidence of the Buddhist crisis showed that he was widely, uh, you know, opposed. Interesting. All this context is so important. Context is critical. Okay, so the key meeting here, October 8th, 1963. We talked about how Big Min approaches the administration with these three different plans. One of them involves assassination, although not of Ziem himself. Uh, Kennedy holds an off-the-record roundtable conference at the White House, citing your work here to consider how they should reply to Big Min's plans. No written records of the meeting have emerged. The American people would have no record of this discussion had it not been secretly tape recorded, and it had not been for my uh, colleague here, Ken Hughes, and his editors transcribing it for the and for the Mark record. And Ken and Mark, Germany. <laughs> that's right, Mark Selvason. We got to give everybody uh, yeah. credit here. Um, Kennedy doesn't record the entire meeting. Begins at 5:30 that night, continues to around 6:15. So it's not a very long meeting. He gets about 25 minutes. 25 minutes in this months-long drama. Mm -hmm. What's the the gist of this meeting after Kennedy presses the record button? What what is ultimately decided here? The the August 24th decision gets compared to the Bay of Pigs a lot. The October 8th decision, Kennedy's decision-making process is more like it was during the Cuban Missile Crisis. He hears from everybody who opposes the coup. He hears from so he's Defense a, Secretary he's a McNamara. a lot of people at this meeting. Yes. Okay. Uh, Defense Secretary McNamara speaks against uh, JCS Chairman Taylor. Uh, McCone has prepared a uh, response saying... Let's tell our CIA guys to say we can't even we can't even bring your proposal to any responsible figures in the U.S. government until we have more information. It's a basic, basically a way of saying no without using the word no. But Kennedy, after having spent weeks hearing his aides debate it at numerous XCOM uh, meetings, after sending more than one mission uh, fact-finding mission to South Vietnam. Um, after exploring all of the issues, says our, our position here is if he overthrows the government, okay. And if he doesn't, okay. The difference here is in August, we went and asked them to overthrow the government, and now we're not going to. Um, he's deciding to give, to give big men a green light to tell him Yes, uh, we will give the new regime American aid. We will not thwart the, uh, your coup attempt. Um, so this is different than, say, what Eisenhower did with 
Patrice Lumumba in Congo, evidence indicating pretty deci uh, decisive evidence, I think, or definitive evidence. Eisenhower ordered the murder of Lumumba in August of 1960. The CIA actually, not the ones who got to him, he was killed by his, his domestic rivals. In this case, it's the generals in South Vietnam coming to Kennedy saying, we want to do this, and he says, go ahead if you feel like you need to do it. Yes. Um, I should point out that in, on that tape, they don't discuss assassination at all. And when you read the cables, and the cables are super important, um, when Kennedy approves a response to Big Men's proposal, the proposal was explicit. Assassination is our first option, and it's the easiest. The reply that Kennedy gives them uh, says to the CIA people in Saigon, we want information about their plans, but do not get drawn into reviewing or advising them. The best line is no line. Okay, this, that's, that's a- Different cable? Okay. That's a different cable. Okay. That's, but that's a, that's a very relevant cable because people want to know what Kennedy's silence on assassination means. And John McCone filled it out in the only explicit guidance that the CIA station in Saigon got on assassination. And it's a, it's a very important cable. Um, it didn't come out in its entirety in the Church Committee report. And the Church Committee report is actually very, uh, I think, misleading because it, it leaves out the first two sentences, which are basically, here is your guidance for assassination discussions. In general, the best line is no line. We can, we're not in favor of assassination, but we're not going to try to stop assassination. Our approach is going to be hands off. We want all the information that the generals can give us, but we will not take any line. So according to McCone's testimony. In the church committee later. Yes. Um, in 75, yeah. long after. You know, he spoke with Kennedy about this, with President Kennedy about this, and he felt that Kennedy agreed, which basically removes plausible deniability. Now that's, we have to make really specifically clear, it's not that Kennedy says it's okay to kill DM. He's silent on the subject. He doesn't say it's not okay to kill ZM or anybody else. He's silent on the subject. Um, and But he could have. He could he, have. If he wanted to, he could have told mm -hmm. McCone, make it clear that if you kill ZM, you're not getting a penny of American aid, for instance. Right. Um, yes, he, he could have made it a condition, and he chose not to. And unfortunately, we don't, we don't know why. He didn't say why. Um, we can speculate, but we're just speculating. It's amazing uh, how you've been able to navigate cryptic language, silence, cables, uh, bureaucratic kind of euphemism to understand what happened here. Well, I think it would not have been completely clear without John McCone's uh, testimony, which included the best line is no line cable, which really makes it very clear we are that the Kennedy administration left it up to the generals to decide. And William Colby. And, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but, sorry. And th but they knew that the generals had assassination on their mind. They did. So. Yes, they were not, it's not like they never thought of this. Yeah. Yeah. They, and, and, and Lodge had brought it up face to face with Kennedy. So Kennedy knew that assassination was a possibility, and yeah. Kennedy had brought yeah. it up himself at the August 28th XCOM meeting. Yeah. We're gonna, go ahead. And, and Big Men had made it explicit. Yes, Big Men wrote, the, so, here's your menu of, of choices. Right. This is a conscious choice by President Kennedy not to take a position. We're gonna wrap up in a bit with the Kennedy mystique and what this story means for that. And of course, he was assassinated shortly after Ziem is murdered. Oh, for the record, the actual coup does not happen until November 2nd, and Ziem and his brother, Nu, are shot to death by the plotters. Shot and stabbed. Shot and stabbed. Um, I have uh, high tech here. I'm going to play something off of my iPhone. This is available on YouTube, actually. Uh, November 4th, 1963, JFK, if he had an iPhone in those days, would have been talking into it the way I'm holding it up here. He... Uh, he uh, he reflects for the historical record on what had just happened. I, I want your interpretation of what this means. Monday, November 4th, 1963. The uh, 
Over the weekend, the uh, coup in Saigon took place. It culminated uh, three months of uh, conversation about a coup, comma, conversation which divided the government here and in Saigon. Opposed to a coup was uh, General Taylor, the Attorney General, Secretary McNamara, to a somewhat less degree, John McCone, partly because of an old hostility to Lodge, which causes him to lack confidence in Lodge's judgment, comma, partly to, as a result of a new hostility, because the Lodge uh, shifted his station chief. Let me call and in favor of the coup was State, led by Abel Harriman, George Ball, Roger Hillsman, supported by Mike Parstow at the White House. I uh, feel that uh, we must bear a good deal of responsibility for it, beginning with our cable of early August, which we suggested the coup. Period, in my judgment, that wire was badly drafted. Comrade should never have been sent on a Saturday. I uh, should not have given my consent to it without a roundtable conference in which McNamara and Taylor could have presented their views. Well, we did redress that balance in later wires. That, that first wire encouraged Lodge along a course to which he was, in any case, inclined. Hawkins continued to oppose the coup on the ground that the military effort was doing well. There was a sharp split between Saigon and the rest of the country. Politically, the situation was deteriorating. Militarily, they had, it had not had its effect. There was a feeling, however, that it would. For this reason, Secretary McNamara and General Taylor supported applying additional pressures to Zim and New in order to move them. Uh, that's his son entering the room there. <laughs> uh, I played two and a half minutes of that. He, he does go on to say that he liked Ziem. He had met Ziem. Uh, do you feel this is a, a president kind of trying to uh, exonerate himself for what happened? I, I want to put that in, in political context because Monday, November 4th, was when Clement Zablocki, who was uh, the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Subcommittee that handled Vietnam, uh, stood up in the House and said um, that he was not satisfied with the administration's explanation for what had gone on. He thought that the aid cuts were a signal for a coup to take place, which wasn't exactly right, but was darned close. Yeah. Um, and he, he said, if we did not insist on the safety of ZM, and if we, if we did not insist on safe passage for ZM, then we're responsible. So by Monday after the coup, it, Kennedy is, is facing, this is a brand new threat. This is a Democrat. This is one of Kennedy's most prominent supporters. He was, during the primaries of, of 1960, um, Kennedy said, I cannot win the nomination if I don't win Wisconsin. And he couldn't win it without Clement Zablocki who had been oh, um, the congressman. Yeah, there's this great documentary called Primary, and you can see Zablocki, uh, you know, he's introducing Kennedy. He holds this huge rally for Kennedy in, uh, in Milwaukee right before the election. And he's, you know, he's, he's really proud of that. Uh, he, he's a very fervent supporter uh, of JFK. And he says, I even, you know, we, we broke the, the fire code to get extra people in there. And a few people fainted, but I think it was worth it. But he is angry on November 4th um, because he had spoken with Kennedy right before the coup. And, uh, you know, he had said to, you know, Kennedy had told him, I don't think ZM can hold on. And Zablocki said, if you support ZM, he'll hold on as yeah. long as you support him. If you withdraw your support, then there's going to be a coup. So Zablocki understood how power was working there. Mm -hmm. uh, when I listened to Kennedy's um, uh, Dicta Belt, the voice memo. It's too bad he didn't have an iPhone, there'd be less crackling. Yeah, there'd be um, less crackling. Um, I, I, I think he's, he's admitting things that people already know. Cable 243 had leaked to the New York Herald Tribune. That's which, the August one. Yeah, that's the August one. Town, yeah. 
Um, and so he, he mentions that. Uh, he, d he mentions also that he had approved it, which was something that hadn't leaked. Um, so that is, a, that is a substantial admission. But when he goes through, like when he's saying who's on what side of the coup, he leaves out two people whose position on the coup would indicate his. Secretary of State Dean Rusk did not allow any daylight between himself and the president on any foreign policy decision. And Rusk was a supporter of the coup. And another guy who um, was, you know, compared to Robert Kennedy as sort of like a, a the president's alter ego was McGeorge Bundy. Interesting. And he was also for the coup, and Kennedy just doesn't mention them. He, he expresses some remorse, too, that Ziem was killed. He says he was shocked that Ziem and New were killed. Um, I don't see how he could possibly have been shocked that New was killed. Um, and the brother. I, the brother, yeah. you know, especially since Big Men said that yeah. was plan A. And also, he, he, I, he had as much sense, JFK had as much sense as Dave Smith, the yeah. acting chief of station of the CIA, and had to realize that, yeah. you know, it was just unfeasible for them to murder new, to murder DM's brothers and leave Ziem alive. So before we wrap up with the Kennedy mystique issue, you've also done something here that's, I find, truly remarkable. You've been able to debunk with your new information the stories that have been out there and have been repeated in footnotes in history books for decades. And we'll focus on one that's really important uh, briefly here. Maxwell Taylor writes uh, a memoir at some point saying that when Kennedy heard that Ziem was killed and his brother, he storms out. Of, there was a meeting going on. He storms out of the meeting. He's looking all distraught. Shocked and dismayed. It's a way of saying Kennedy had nothing to do with the assassination. Yeah. Yeah, this he, was this was a fantasy. This was a fabrication. He, it's, a, it's a beautiful one, though. He, he, he sets the scene very dramatically. He says it's November 1st. It's at the XCOM meeting, the first after the coup starts. And uh, we know that took place from 10 a.m. to 12.15. And uh, somebody comes in with a cable saying that uh, ZM and New are dead. At that point, um, you know, the story was that they had committed suicide. But Kennedy, of course, instant re instantly realizes that that can't possibly be true, uh, given their religious background. And he, uh, is, he leaps to his feet and, and leaves the room with a look of shock and dismay <laughs> on his face. And M Maxwell Taylor says that that's because he had always insisted that ZM be unharmed. Um, and and like, there's the nothing first, in the record to suggest that. Yeah. Um, I told you before, yeah. my parents were scientists. They raised me uh, the falsification principle. Scientists try to prove theories by disproving them. They, you, you, don't, you haven't tested a theory until you've tried to prove it false. So when I you see a historical claim or a theory, I try to prove it false. And the first thing I noticed was that during this XCOM meeting, ZM and New were both alive. <laughs> they had not died, and that they, there were no false reports that they had died. And then I looked for all the evidence that, that Kennedy had ever insisted on their safety. And there, just, there was only that one comment at the 28 August 1963 XCOM meeting, which in context uh, is never turned into an instruction. That's right. So yeah, there, we have the tapes of the meeting, but what matters is what was told to the people on the ground in Saigon. Right. And I think there was also a cable the day before the coup, or the coup's already underway, saying something about, well, don't, maybe don't kill these guys, but at that point it was too late. Right, yes, yeah, so on the day of the coup, yeah. like when it's just yeah. a few hours, you know, when, when ZM yeah. and New just have a few hours to live, yeah. uh, there's a State Department cable saying to Lodge, you know, if we, we know that the generals are making their own decisions and they might not be open to your suggestions, but we'd like them to keep in mind safe passage for ZM and New. I mean, it's a very mild yeah. suggestion. The, th the amazing thing about this Maxwell Taylor story, I mean, why wouldn't you believe it? Maxwell Taylor was a key decision maker, key player. He was there. It's an eyewitness account. Eyewitness account uh, gets repeated, oh, picked oh. up by historians. You know, as a reader of history, I also often read footnotes to see where certain things are coming from. You trust that <laughs> they're accurate. Yes. I mean, it gives me pause. I, mean, I, not, I don't want to overstate the case, but in this case, this is a story that, what is it now? Six, yeah, yeah. 60 years, total, total nonsense. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, he told the story first in the early 1970s, so for, it's been oh, repeated 70s, okay. for 
over 50 years and over 50 books. And these are not just minor books. Oh, Robert by, Dalek wrote one. Yeah, Pulitzer Prize winners ha have won them, uh, professors of history, uh, famous journalists, liberals and conservatives both back this story. And there's no way it could possibly be true. And I go through all the different versions of it. Yes. Like Arthur Schlesinger, uh, who was a Kennedy speechwriter as well as an historian, repeats the tale, but he takes off all the, all the details that can prove it wrong, like the date and the time and the idea that... Yeah, and Kennedy that's no small figure in historical no, scholarship, he's Arthur Schlesinger. He's, he won two Pulitzer Prizes, yes. and he was a, a Harvard professor of history. Wow. And then well, you've, McNamara... you've uh, corrected the record. Go yeah, ahead. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, you're saying Ma McNamara, yeah. McNamara did his own bogus eyewitness account, ch switching it to November 2nd. Uh, at the XCOM meeting on November 2nd morning, but that can't be true either because Kennedy would have read that Xiamen knew were dead in the New York Times. He would have read it in his daily intelligence brief. Uh, the first cable had come through more than 10 hours earlier. And the, uh, the memcon, the, the memo of the meeting, shows that his aides were discussing the deaths of Xiamen knew before Kennedy arrived, and Kennedy brought up their deaths himself. And we can listen to him discuss it, and he's, he's very calm. Yeah. Uh, you know, he talks about the, the thing being bothersome. That, that yeah. they're, he's a pragmatist in the recordings, right? He's not, yeah. He doesn't get emotional. He's a, a very cool customer. Yeah, 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 analytical thinker. So part of the Kennedy mystique is, had he only lived, had he only come back from Dallas alive after his trip there November 22nd, the, he might have pulled the United States out of Vietnam and our country would have avoided it. The, the Vietnamese people would have avoided that horrible war. Uh, what do you think of that before we move on to other aspects of the, the darker side of Camelot is what we're getting at here, but go ahead. Well, I, I actually tie it into the darker side of Camelot because I think by the time he died, JFK had figured out how to get out of Vietnam. He, he seems to have understood it was a losing proposition. He only solved short-term problems by greenlighting the coup that only that resolved the Buddhist crisis. Um, so that was not an indication of his commitment to Vietnam, yeah. getting rid of Xiem. That was just a short-term... A short-term fix that would get South Vietnam off the front pages in 64. But he, he, um, he apparently discussed this with one of his closest and oldest aides, Kenny O'Donnell, and said, you know, I, I can't get out now but I can do it after I'm reelected, so we better make sure I'm reelected. And after I'm reelected and get out, I will be one of the least popular presidents in American history. Um, he compared what would happen to him to the Joe McCarthy Red Scare, which was built around who lost China. Uh, and that was, of course, never ours to lose. But uh, a lot of politicians, including young JFK, blamed the U.S. State Department for not giving the nationalist Chinese enough backing. And that was a very powerful political argument, though it doesn't make much sense in retrospect. It doesn't seem like a little more aid would have done it. But Kennedy, I think, was, was correct in predicting that if he got out of Vietnam in 65 and the communists took over, he would definitely be uh, attacked for uh, snatching defeat from the jaws of victory and sending American boys to uh, die in vain. Because, you know, by 63, about 100 already had died in Vietnam, right. even though they were not in, technically in combat. Right. They, they were, were advisors. They were being shot at. Yes. Um, and, but he said to um, they asked him how he would do it. And he said, easy, I'll just put in a government that will ask me to leave. And I think by learning f about the ZM coup and the leverage that American aid gave American presidents over the South Vietnamese government, we can see how easily he, he could have done that. And it was still fairly obvious to the newspapers that the U.S. government was responsible for the coup, and it would have been even more obvious yeah. um, in, in 65 because that would have been a much more unpopular decision. As you know, Frederick Logoval, a great Vietnam scholar, I think he's made the convincing case that Johnson had an opportunity to get the United States out of Vietnam and pay a minimal political price or a short-term political price that the American people would have eventually forgotten because in the end, Vietnam was not 
a vital national security interest of the United States. We see that now, but um, you know, China, yes. China was not a, a right. vital uh, interest to the national security of the United States. After the communists took over China, America had the 1950s, a period of yes. relative peace and prosperity yeah. and you know, of, of strength. Um, and I, 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 think, I think Fred, who was a great scholar, yeah. underestimates the, uh, the level of political price that JFK or LBJ would have to pay in 1965 when his opponents would be able to say, hey, we, we wouldn't have had to do much to win the war in Vietnam. Just, just keep backing them or, you know, or stick with ZM, which was, is one of the arguments that uh, some conservatives make in retrospect. Mm -hmm. I think it's a false argument. It's based on a fantasy that things would have worked out. But that fantasy is, is not... Uh, is not uh, politically ineffective. True, you know, good, good leadership though. You can go to the American people and, and say why we're doing this and for the reasons and you can say, listen, there's gonna be a problem after we leave. I'm not saying it's gonna be, you know, the Garden of Eden over there, but here are the, the negatives if we stay. Hypothetical, of course, but November 22nd, 1963, I was not alive. Of course, my parents were, they've told me, you know, everyone remembers what they were doing or how they felt at that moment. Uh, people watching television at home in the afternoon had their soap operas or whatever it was interrupted and Walter Conkright breaks the news. You weren't alive either, but I'm sure no. your parents have talked to you about <laughs> it. Um, Kennedy, so young and full of vitality and his beautiful family with these little children running around the White House after basically, what, 30 years of old men being president, <laughs> FDR, Truman, grandfather, Lee Eisenhower, Talking about Camelot, the Kennedy mystique. And when you die young and tragically, you know, that's frozen. Right? That's where we, Kennedy will always be young. And, uh, you know, he didn't have an opportunity to screw up his second term or make really bad mistakes that people would have remembered him for because the first thing that comes to mind is he was assassinated. Um, what are your thoughts on the Kennedy mystique and how it's had such staying power? I mean, people to this day get emotional when they think about the assassination. Um. I, I, I understand it. My parents uh, both voted for JFK and thought he was the last presidential candidate that they could vote enthusiastically for. And, uh, you know, I, I grew up with him as a household hero. Uh, I think uh, my parents had three Kennedy books. They had a bunch of them, but three re really made a big impact on me. Profiles in Courage, which is about the need for political leaders to demonstrate courage. Um, the Making of the President 1960, which is a very hagiographic uh, account of Kennedy's yeah. election victory. And Johnny, We Hardly Knew Ye, which was written by Kenny O'Donnell and Dave Powers, and a, a journalist who was coincidentally named Joe McCarthy, <laughs> oddly okay. enough. And that's where um, the, the account of Kennedy's uh, idea of how to get out of Vietnam comes from. And basically, you know, both my books are, they're about those those subjects, political courage versus political calculation, presidential politics and how presidential politics affect uh, f decisions about foreign policy and to the detriment of American foreign policy. Very, very often with, with Nixon, we saw very clearly and with, to a lesser extent, we see clearly with Johnson and Kennedy that presidential electoral considerations played a role in their decisions about Vietnam. And um, uh, certainly with Nixon in the decent interval, but yes, uh, yeah, yeah, not to digress about Tricky Dick, but um, <laughs> oh, please do. <laughs> <laughs> We're at, but uh, no, but yeah, but the Kennedy mystique has had a hold on us. And I guess what I'm trying to get at here is not to destroy him entirely, his reputation. There's the good and the bad. Uh, what I mentioned earlier, the continuities and the structural causation. Eisenhower had the coup in Iran in 53, Guatemala in 54, orders the assassination of Lumumba in 1960. Kennedy in the Bay of Pigs, and then Operation Mongoose. He and his brother seemed obsessed with trying to get rid of Castro. They even tried to hire mafia hitmen to kill Castro, poison his cigars, whatever it was. Then we have this in, in South Vietnam, where he greenlights the coup of an American ally, and the man winds up dead uh, hours after he's toppled. I want people to think of these continuities and these structures rather than these images. Yeah. He can, or both, do both. You can do both. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I was not alive in those, those years, so I never bought into the Kennedy mystique, but 
certainly the Reagan <laughs> aura affected me as a young person. And as I've gotten to know more about Reagan's real record, I don't look at him the same way I did as when I was a teenager. Um, so it, it, what we learn, it complicates things. All the presidents, even the best ones, have dark sides. Um, you know, Franklin Roosevelt and even you know, Abraham Lincoln. Uh, and it's, right. it's important for us, I think, like you say, and as an historian, I 100% endorse it. We, we need to learn more of what they're like as politicians and human beings trying to lead a diverse and often contentious country that um, you know, often a lot of uh, people just don't pay much attention to these life or death issues until they become crises or catastrophes. Yeah, and so, it's good, important to also recommend the, or I'm sorry, recognize, this is what I'm trying to say, the weight of the structures too, because it's very easy for us to sit here, and I think we probably right. The United States should not have greenlighted the coup of Jem, should not have gotten involved in Vietnam, should not have ordered the killing of Congo's first democratically elected leader. But when you're in the chair, right, you feel the, the weight of these structural causes and ideology notions of personal credibility, national credibility, et cetera. Mm -hmm. It's just a, it's a way of putting yourself in their shoes if that's possible. And it's, and if to we To understand that, history rather than judge it, I guess mm -hmm. is the way I'm trying to say it. And the better we understand them, the better we can as citizens lead them. You know, we can, we, the, the relationship is all not just president uh, over citizen. Yeah. We have a great say as long as we exercise it and the direction of the government. Yeah. Also, and, the problem with covert operations, it's undemocratic, right? Yes. It's unaccountable. We, right? th these, these are decisions made behind closed doors. I wanna say everybody who uh, is wedded to the idea that a president was overthrown in a coup in November of 1963 uh, that uh, was the result of a conspiracy at the highest levels of the US government, please check out our transcripts and the essay I wrote about the ZM coup to see Absolutely. how an actual uh, international conspiracy that results in a coup and a presidential assassination. Millercenter.org, is that the website? I, I I'm so, per, so. so well prepared. I, I, really, okay. well, I, I work there and I, I that's think right. it's millercenter.org. Well, you know, there's that thing called Google. You can do Miller Center, Ken Hughes, Kennedy coup, and you'll find all the materials. Ken Hughes of the University of Virginia, author of Fatal Politics and Chasing Shadows. Thank you for being mm -hmm. here. Thank you to our listeners for this special episode of History As It Happens.